Good afternoon. I'm Susan Weber, and joining Walker and Dunlop CEO Willie Walker today is Alan Fleischman of Laurel Strategies. Willie and Alan will discuss a broad range of topics, including leadership in the partially remote work world, topics on the minds of global CEOs, and much more. Thank you for joining us today, and now over to Willie. Thank you, Susan, and uh, good afternoon to those of you in the East Coast, and uh, good morning to those further to the West where I am today. Uh, it's a real joy to have my uh, old friend, uh, colleague, partner, a lot of different things I could call Alan, Alan Fleischman joining me today. Let me do a quick intro of Alan, and then I very much look forward to diving into our conversation. Uh, Alan Fleischman is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Laurel Strategies a global CEO strategic advisory firm for leaders, chief executives, and their C-suite. Laurel Strategies helps design comprehensive strategies on corporate communications, government affairs, crisis management, investor relations, media relations, corporate governance, and business intelligence. Previously, Alan was a founding principal and member of the managing board and operating committee of Albright Stonebridge Group, Alan is a lifetime member of the Council on Foreign Relations and an Executive Committee Board member of the Atlantic Council. He has served on the board of the Jane Goodall Institute, the Eisenhower Fellowships, and is a founding member of the Clinton Global Initiative. In addition, he serves on the board of the American Council on Germany, the Cal Ripken Foundation, the James R. Jordan Foundation, the Deepak Chopra Foundation, and the Just Capital Foundation. Uh, and there is more. Fleischman is a board member of the Phillips Collection Art Museum, the Washington National Opera of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, a member of the Board of Trustees of Morehouse College and Carnegie Hall. Alan went to American University undergrad where he was valedictorian and student body president, and he received a master's degree from Johns Hopkins. Alan is host of Leadership Matters on Sirius XM Radio, and has authored numerous articles on leadership and CEO statement, statesmanship. He is married to the wonderful Daphna, lives in Washington, DC, and is the father of two daughters, one of whom was just accepted to Columbia University. And so many, many congratulations to you on that, Alan. Uh, let's start here. Let's back up a little bit. I'm probably, I don't think you thought I was gonna go here, but let's uh, start by talking about your mom and dad, Arno and Laura, both amazing people. Um, how about starting by telling the story about your dad coming to America from Germany, enlisting uh, to go fight in World War II only four years after arriving in America, and the unique relationship he forged with Dwight Eisenhower? Wow. I did not think you were going there, but first I should say thank you for having me on. I've been a, uh, um, a real fan of this uh, webcast, and I've had you on my show, and that was uh, a big thrill for me. So. Don't want to let you down, my friend, and uh, I look forward to the conversation. I didn't expect you to talk with my to talk, start with my mom and dad, but you're right. Everything does with me start with them and the way I think of the world. My dad did come to this country uh, in 1940 as a young teenager, uh, and then turned around as a soldier in World War II. Uh, he was in the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, as a young infantryman, he uh, got caught up in what became a really major moment in, uh, in the early war uh, where he identified a spy ring, a very famous spy ring where there were a bunch of German assassins who had, who had uh, I guess, um, uh, presented themselves as American. My father was one of the folks who figured out that they were indeed German uh, and, uh, and they were destined or determined to, uh, to, to assassinate Dwight Eisenhower. When Eisenhower learned of this, my father was plucked out uh, from being on the front lines and uh, ended up being assigned to Eisenhower and was in actually the little red schoolhouse uh, at the surrender at the end of the war with, with General Eisenhower and had many, many special moments during the war, uh, at the end of the war, where he was with uh, General Eisenhower and then with General Clay, uh, where he stayed on in Germany, uh, in Berlin for several years that followed. And to this day, we've got amazing relationships with uh, wonderful friends and family in Germany from that period of time. Uh, and we have a very close relationship with several members of the Eisenhower family, uh, also from uh, from the last years of that time. My dad was a very humble man, an incredible human being, uh, who uh, he wrote a book a few years ago called Lights and Shadows. He died a year and a half ago um, at the age of 93 and a half, but he was a, a special man, as was my mother, 
uh, and uh, like you, uh, we we um, we honor those who came before us, and uh, it's a big part of what our ambitions about, and certainly in my case, in your case as well. There's a a piece of your family's history, Alan, that caught my attention, which is that um, they had a department store in Baltimore that was actually Warren Buffett's first company acquisition. Have you ever discussed that deal with the Oracle of Omaha? Yes, I have. You know, it wasn't it, what it was is that there was a great family branch that went to Baltimore. Uh, from the night from the 1800s, where a brother and where, where a couple of siblings went to Baltimore, and then a few siblings stayed in Germany, and that extraordinary family in Baltimore were really the ones who helped get the family in Germany out in the 40s, uh, and they were very devoted to their cousins to get them safely on the other side of the of the Atlantic, and uh, there was a great department store in Baltimore in the age when every great city had a great department store or two. Uh, one of them was called Hochul Cone. It was a very prominent department store which our cousins actually owned uh, and actually a great uncle of of um, the great great uncle of mine was one of the leading partners and other great great uncle lived with my father in germany uh, and when warren buffett set out to start berkshire hathaway his very first investment was buying that department store in 1966 and actually one of our cousins actually uh in lieu of getting uh cash took equity in berkshire hathaway and joined the board and is extremely close to to Warren Buffett to this day and on the board to this day, uh, it was a good investment actually. Um, and at one point during one of these wonderful gatherings in Washington, I've seen him a few times in my life, I had the ability to sit next to him. And I brought up thinking, you know, that would be an interesting conversation. What struck me about Warren Buffett, which says so much about his leadership, is he loved annual reports. He loved in the day when people wrote their annual reports, he would really get into the, into the kind of the messaging in them he also loved genealogy and family trees. He knew as much about my family and family tree, you know, decades later. Uh, he actually knew, I know more about your family than you know about your family. He was wrong in that case, me, but certainly more than 90% of my family uh, in his knowledge of who they were and what they did. Uh, but he was able to actually cite names of people decades later and remain close to several of them. So it's an amazing, amazing uh, look into the way he thinks of the world. So as I was taking a look into your background, Alan, uh, the fact that you were president of your class at AU surprised me, not that it surprised me that you were elected, but that you had interest in, if you will, an elected position. I've always viewed you throughout your career as this masterful advisor, somebody who can think strategically, um, but to a great degree, other than leading your own organization, somebody who has helped people, whether in the world of politics, whether in the world of business, to be the leaders that they are. And so when I saw that you ran and won for class president at AU, I was just curious, have you ever thought about going back into politics and being out in front? God, you ask great questions and nobody ever asked me. You know, there was a time in my life that my big dream job probably was to be a U.S. senator one day. When I was a young kid growing up, you know, uh, that was my dream. I, I volunteered on a Senate campaign when I was 11. I've always felt that, you know, harnessing the power of civil society, public life and private sector was something that we had to do and then turn into good. Uh, and I've always saw myself in, a, in that kind of public facing role. But to your point along the way, uh, when it comes, whether it's because of scale and influence or impact, a part of me realized that I could do more by helping others lead uh, and be with them and working with them to find whether in, in private sector, public sector and civil society, to, you know, to help them find their voices and then help them amplify them. And that, that became a big part of my life. And it, it doesn't distract me from my day to day. You know, we get caught up in ourselves. I am a CEO and I work with CEOs and there's a public facing part of my life, but I do probably appreciate the, uh, the parts of my life where I can quietly lead others to success and obviously be part of that success, uh, but not be distracted. Uh, but that was, a, that was definitely, a, there was definitely a fork in the road at some point. And I want to know, when was that? You know, I went to work with Kathleen Kennedy Townsend when she won elective office in Maryland. I started off as, I was up on the Foreign Affairs Committee as a staff director of their Western Hemisphere subcommittee and on the Foreign Affairs Committee, and I loved being on the Hill. And then when Kathleen won, she asked me to be her chief of staff, my home state of Maryland. Uh, I served with her, and I, it may have been the, the, the plentiful opportunities in those days of having too many options, but I was able to be on a bank board have a life in public life as a chief of staff, and then or creating organizations and, and 
in civil society, nonprofits. And I found that the more I did and could actually get involved in those things, the more satisfied I felt about my impact. Um, and early on, when I think I took on that job, I probably thought one day I'd run. But I kind of knew too much, saw too much, and realized too much. And I think at some point I realized uh, it was the private sector and then leaders in, in all three sectors that was calling me. We lost her about the same time as you lost your dad. How did you deal with the loss of those two extremely close people to you, very close to in timing when we lost Kathleen and lost your dad? You mean Mae Townsend, when we lost your daughter, you mean, yeah. Her daughter, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, 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 please. Yeah. That is actually um, still one of the most difficult losses for me personally, and obviously for Kathleen and for the Kennedy family, uh, enduring. It's one of those things where, you know, she was in her early 40s, uh, one of the most talented, Mae Kennedy Townsend, Mae McCain, um, you know, was one of the most talented people I've ever known. And to this day, I hear her laugh. I hear her, her joyfulness, her challenging uh, status quo. Uh, she has so much of her mother in her, actually. Uh, but she just she was unique in her own way. And then she had this beautiful son, Gideon, uh, and through a freak of life and accident, uh, that they, they perished in the early days of COVID uh, um, and on the Chesapeake Bay. And, you know, that still haunts us as a family. And we miss her terribly. If you come into my kitchen in our home, we've got pictures of her everywhere just so we can have breakfast with her every morning. That's kind of what we'd say at home. Um, and my dad's loss, in many ways, there was um, being in his 90s and she being so young, you know, both losses meant a lot, you know, and it, and it taught me a little bit. I lost my mother when I was young. Um, but no matter when you lose a loved one, old or young, if, you know, the void is real, the void is long. And, uh, you know, what we do with that and how you actually make them feel present, I think is everything. I believe in energy. I believe in the immortality in the sense of their presence. And I think that helps a lot. I think I saw a picture of your mom at your graduation from AU. I'm correct that she was still alive. She died in 88, right? So she That's was there right. graduation from college, which had to have been a very special moment. She knew you were headed on to great things. Yeah, she was a, a force of nature. She was active in the fashion world. She she had a, you know, she's one of those people, I was just having a conversation with my older daughter about her. She's named after her. Uh, my two daughters, Laura, Julia, and Talia, uh, have so much of her in them. Uh, in all the good sense of, uh, you know, perseverance, steely-eyed, focused, big personalities. Uh, sometimes a little loud. My mother was that too. So you kind of, <laughs> you know, all three women have that. Um, but I, I would say that the, the thing that was, we're talking about the big presence of people in our lives, the people that tell you what you don't want to hear. Uh, but know that they're doing it for you or the people we miss the most. Yeah, no doubt about that. I, I had a conversation last night with a, a a very influential CEO who will remain nameless, but I was giving him some feedback that I'm not so sure he really wanted to hear. But um, I, at the end of the conversation, he was very appreciative of the perspective that I gave him on some issues that he's uh, working on right now. You know, um, Willie, you're known for that. I should say that you're known as being the person in someone's life who will challenge you. And what's so wonderful is that, you know, some people challenge others, but they don't challenge themselves. When you challenge other people, you're actually challenging yourself every day as well. And, uh, you know, you've, you've also shown in the last few years, the, the value and the power of being vulnerable and sharing that as well, which I, which, you know, struck me deeply. Yeah, that I would say it's interesting that, that, that challenging side to my, pers my personality clearly comes from my father. Uh, my father is an incredibly analytical person and is constantly asking questions. And so if you say something to my dad, he always he always wants to peel the onion and get down to really what the issue is. And um, there's no doubt that I learned that from him. I think one of the interesting things, Alan, that I found, and it's similar to you having your radio show, is that in doing all the research and, and having now 80 plus conversations like this, um, I, I truly do believe that I've been a better question asker that I had a friend of mine point this out last week where he just said, the way you ask questions without being either putting people on the defensive or feeling like you're attacking them is fully different now that you've done so many of these interviews and you can get people to talk about things that maybe previously you couldn't. And um, I'm certain that you found a similar type thing as you've done your prep for your serious Leadership Matters show. You know, it's funny, I, David Rubenstein, who you know well from Washington, who's a great business mind, great business leader, and a great American, great philanthropist, 
Uh, he's a great interviewer. And he, you know, the Economic Club in Washington and, uh, and then the show that he has on Bloomberg. I had him on the show and I actually am having him again soon because he just wrote another great book called The American Experiment. I worked so hard to prepare for that show and I, in a way that I hadn't for any of the other shows I did because he was a great person to ask questions of you. And it was so rare that people asked questions of him that I wanted to get a home run. I didn't want him, I didn't want, I, I couldn't, couldn't be good, it had to be great. And I remember thinking that in many ways, the art of my firm, which I'm most proud of, is I always say to clients, we'll be the ones who will come in with the right questions. We'll get the right answers, but we're not gonna come in with the idea that we have the right answers walking in the door. We're not gonna come in with that idea that we're gonna give you the prepared PowerPoint before we talk to you. Um, we're gonna walk in the door with questions and then we're gonna think through with you what those right answers might be. And I think in life, I tell that to my girls, my daughters, you know, in life, I think it's, it's really about listening and it's about asking the right questions and then, and then formulating the right strategy. So talk a little bit about the formation of Laurel Strategies because you'd been at Albright Stonebridge, you were a founding principal there, you were on the management board, incredible firm. Uh, yours and my mutual friend, Michael Warren, now leads the, leads the charge there. Um, and you bound out on your own. What was the, what was the reason for that? Uh, where, where did that entrepreneurial bug come from, Alan? You know, I think there was a restlessness in me. First of all, I should actually acknowledge truly one of the great firms and one of the great Albright Stromage and one of the great assemblages of uh, talent yeah. and, and mixed talent of any firm there ever could have been. And, and I, I'm so grateful and fortunate to have been able to work with people who were 30 years my senior uh, in many cases, and then others like Michael, who you mentioned, who are one of the great talents of our generation. And But there was a bug in me whether it was cultural, meaning I needed to have my own culture, uh, or whether it was just the entrepreneur in me who needed to create and curate something, um, I was restless. And I tried so hard to figure out other ways to, um, to fulfill that promise in me or that, that, that promise I was making to myself. I had so many people around me who said, if you build it, I will come. And I, you know, and I got to be a little more focused on the CEOs and the firm by its nature, knowing Madeline at the helm, for example, and Sandy Berger at the time, were very focused on the diplomacy, the corporate diplomacy, which I do too, and we do at Laurel, the government relations side, which we do, but we were really into the CEO part and my side and my head and the work that I was doing. And it became clear to me that there was an opportunity in the niche to really focus on leaders and their C-suite in a way that, frankly, um, if you don't focus on it, it gets diluted too quickly and it doesn't work. You know, the horizontal perspective as well as individual P&Ls, uh, you know well as a CEO, you know, you know, you're thinking holistically all the time and you need to, and individual P&Ls. But for a lot of people, they're in the, they're in the fast, quick paced world of their own verticals. And you have to do both. And whether it had to do with strategy, messaging, positioning, thought leadership, crisis management, the more and more I work with CEOs, the more and more I realized there was a void. The funny part is I've never blinked at the idea of starting my own firm or blinked at the idea of having many people working with me. Um, what's it like to have a big payroll? What's it like to grow something? That, and people always ask me that question, doesn't it make you wake up at 3 a.m.? The only time that I thought about it in a fragile, vulnerable sense was with COVID. I felt like I can't get sick. There are too many people who work with me and there are too many clients I have who depend on me for me to be out even for a sick day. So I became a little bit of a hermit during COVID where I just was a little more protective than most, uh, probably because I was worried a little bit about others, worrying about me, worrying about them, if that makes sense. But I, I, it was a big decision to move on from Albright Strong, which is a culture that I felt very strongly connected to, but the entrepreneurial bug won in the end, and I'm glad. So one of the interesting things there is that your focus was really on leadership and CEOs and the C-suite, if you will and not necessarily on the political side. And Albridge Stonebridge, Albridge, Albright Stonebridge was very much, while working with companies, while working with investors and sovereign wealth funds and things of that nature, what I would deem is, is more politically oriented because of Madeline, because of Sandy, and, and that everything kind of similar to Carlisle as a private equity firm with its roots in DC for a long period of time as David was building it, people would say, oh, that's that private equity firm that focuses on the government sector. You know, and obviously Carlisle is now much, much broader. But departing from those roots, departing from the kind of the Washington establishment and moving out to more corporate America, 
How'd you make that transition? You know, it's amazing. You know, first I should say there were eight CEOs who said to me, if you build it, I will come. And I think the day after I announced that I was leaving the firm, Albright Stromerich to start Laurel, I looked at Daphna and as my wife and I said, um, who, what a nutty, what a dumb decision to start a firm on April 30th, just as people start to go off for the summer and start to travel. It's kind of like the check is in the mail. You know, they're not going to be there. Uh, and it turned out, though, that I was wrong, thank goodness. Now, all eight of those CEOs became clients within 12 days and joined the firm. And um, we had a bill from really, you know, I never got to be the uh, guy who had pizza on the floor in the garage startup. No, I'll tell I got you, Guy Raz will never have you on his show because the theme of Guy Raz on how I built this is that you have to be a struggling entrepreneur in the garage with the pizza boxes on the floor and almost lose everything before you like hit it yeah. big to get on his show. And I've talked to him about it. And he says, that's just my, that's my theme, Willie. That's the way that, that these things work. You can't, you can't have started something like Laurel Strategies and watched it just keep on going up. You have to have had that major crisis moment to get on how I built this. So unfortunately, he's never going to have you on his show. I won't be on his show then. But I will say the one thing though, I didn't have the infrastructure built yet. I didn't have the people hired yet. So it was really amazing how many people came forward and said, almost like volunteers, you know, like, you know, I'll be there as you create your own assembly line of, 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 uh, of infrastructure and how many people said, I'll help you. And, 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 we, and I always feel that I'm always indebted to those people who gave me the time, their energy, their insight and their, and their inc incredible capacity in those early days of Laurel. And then we, we pulled together the greatest team in the world. I, I'm so grateful for the people I work with. We had a holiday lunch just last week, probably the last moment where we all could be together again before everybody's shutting down once again. And we, everyone got tested that day and we came in and we sat around the diplomat, the restaurant, you know, well in Washington. And it was, I got to look around the room and just see in the eyes of so many talented people, how lucky I am. And, you know, people who are all in devoted, who understand the power of what we do and understand the, um, the vulnerability of what we do as well. Meaning that we are there when our clients need us most. And sometimes it's very lonely for them. And we worry, we're a bunch of warriors and warriors at Laurel. Uh, but it was, it's wonderful. So as I, as I hear you say that, Alan, and I thought about this as I was doing my homework on you, why do people work with you? Not Laurel, you. Wow, you ask great questions. Um, I don't know the answer, except I would say I, um, we're, I'm all in. I'm surrounded by people who are all in. We don't make promises we don't deliver. I think our, our, our rate of success return is 99.9%. .9%. We envision together, we will um, be there to both preempt and be proactive, to be responsive and reactive in ways that I think isn't normal. It isn't the usual way. We're very quick. We're we don't believe good is good enough. But I would say I care. And I get connected to the people in a way that they know that I understand them. I will push them in ways in which they are uncomfortable sometimes, but I also will protect. I mean, the, the caring aspect of this goes very far. You know, that worry of warrior is not just a bunch of words to me. I really do. We advance, but we also do care. We protect and uh, we believe reputation matters. Nowadays, it always has. But nowadays, there's so many um, opportunities to really bring down people too quickly um, in ways you don't really have the, the chance to defend yourself. So we do a lot of, um, you know, work to really kind of create that that really authentic DNA of an organization and someone's reputation so people really know who they are so that they can withstand the bad times. And there always are challenging times, but also to advance in good times. And we're there there as well. So I think it's because we care. I'm not care. I, I don't know the answer. I, so I'll think about that a little more. <laughs> yeah, let me try and push a little bit harder on that because there are a lot of organizations that care. There are also a lot of organizations that work really hard. Uh, there are also a lot of organizations that are quick. Is there a is there something you had eight CEOs who said that if you put out your own shingle that they'd come with you? So what was it that you'd done previously for them, whether it was some anecdote on a crisis management where you helped some company get through an extremely difficult time? What was it on the launch of a of a new product or strategy that was done exceptionally well that one CEO said to another CEO, if you want someone who's really good on this, you need to work with Alan. Well, that clearly is the case today where I feel the greatest business development for us is from others who've worked with us. You know, some of our greatest champions are our current clients who tell 
future clients, you know, you got to work with my team or you got to know Laurel. We're very much in the confidentiality. And I always say, people say, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm an indispensable and devotion business, you know, where, you know, that we're, at the end of the day, that's what we do. Um, I, I do think the quickness and quality matters a lot. Uh, this is a great question you're asking. I think the real essence of why people want to work with us um, is because we will, we will, we will know you. Um, and we will help you know yourself even better today than you may have known yourself yesterday and help you dream big and make sure we reach those dreams. I, and it's real. Like we do a whole stakeholder mapping session when clients come on board where we envision not only the world they live in today and to help them manage their stakeholders, but imagine the, the stakeholders of tomorrow and how do we actually elegantly, non-self-promotionally, um, really transition to that so it's transformational rather than transactional. And I say these words really deliberately um, because at the end of the day, we live in a world where people always look like they're promoting or they're doing. Some people excel at doing that. I would say at Laurel, we're very good at reaching goals always, but do it in a very organic and natural way. And I think helping people find their voice and hear their voice and, and have impact is what we do. And we, we're not satisfied until we really, we really, really know you. Yeah, that's really interesting. The the no, I mean, I, look, it's it sounds almost trite to know your customer, but clearly in your work and how you all have been successful, you really do differentiate on understanding your customer. And what's so fascinating to me is that most of the customers you work with don't necessarily want people to know them. So there's not one of the main reasons they work with you. One of the reason, reasons you're so discreet about your work is because you're working with billionaires and lead, world leaders and people who have really, really big personas. And so you've got to, that, that's got to be somewhat difficult because you've gotten yourself in with these people who, A, want to make sure that the messaging they're putting out is very consistent and very excellent. You have to get to know them, but to just get to know them is often a big challenge. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. A lot of the folks we work with were unknown when we started. So they, they're, and they're, they're accomplished or they're accomplishing great things or they have recently accomplished great things, but luckily that narrative about them hasn't been written yet. So let's not let someone write it for them, but let them write it for themselves. Or they've reached a level of success, but they realize and we realize that it's, you're not yet a household name. Therefore, we got to make sure that the, that the word of the organization and the word of the reputation of the CEO uh, and the leadership team is really understood. And then there are those who, come along our way, shockingly, you know them well, you've heard of them well, we work with them, but they don't trust. I guess that's what we're having used yet in this uh, interview yet, um, but the word trust matters. And I think that probably is the answer to your earlier question. Why do you want to work with us? At the end of the day, I always joke that I want to be known for being loyal and trustworthy. And I, I think that's true of every single solitary person in Royal Strategies. It's all about honoring that trust. And I think you can be a very well-known celebrity and feel like you've been robbed along the way reputationally. Uh, you could be a very well-known uh, leader, CEO, and feel like you're not understood. Um, and you could be someone who knows that you're going to be well-known any day now or soon enough. And I want to make sure that um, it's handled appropriately and with a great deal of care and detail. You are the most detailed per detail-oriented person I know, Willie. And I like to say that I'm the second most detail-oriented person I know. <laughs> so if we, I want to focus for a moment. You have a big role in Forbes magazine uh, list of their CEO awards. And, and, and in, I want to focus on 2020 for a second, Alan, because I know you had a lot to do with who got on that list. And so therefore you looked at a lot of leadership traits that sort of emerged in 2020. And, you know, 2020 will be a year that sort of, it, it, it defied simple descriptions. It was a year that was so challenging. It had moments during the pandemic that grow, drove incredible innovation um, across medicine and industry. Um, a lot of different trends emerged that we're still living with today, like work from home. Um, and as you look back on that and the leaders that you and Forbes decided to put on that list, what were the, the key components, if you will, that those leaders exhibited, if you will, during the pandemic, during such a challenging year of 2020, that, that those of us who weren't on the list might learn something from? You know, there are many, one, we, one of the great gifts of life is I get to work with some extraordinary people. 
and the clients I'm talking about. And so many of our clients stepped up in ways that actually um, in, it inspired me too. You know, the, this idea that, you know, um, you know, you know, this is great crow, your personality is how you respond to a typical day and your character is how you respond to a challenging day. And I, I think that our clients in every way are the leaders you read about, uh, are the ones who got up during the, the, the aftermath of George Floyd, or were the ones who said, we're not going to lay off people in the early days of the pandemic and we're employee first. Uh, the ones who actually joined forces to make sure that access to opportunity and uh, and you know became a paramount priority to them and their organizations or businesses that they run, whether they're small inventors and startups or they're the major organizations and businesses of our time. One person I'll mention, I don't talk about our clients much, as you know, but one I would mention because it was it became the inspiration to me personally, but also the inspiration to so many of our clients is Albert Borla, who's the CEO of Pfizer. To be there in the earliest days of the pandemic and to watch a man who wasn't known. I mean, Forbes actually did an early first story about him. It became a cover story, but it was the first profile of this Greek American who came over, whose career was at Pfizer, who is, um, you know, who, who is a Dr. Borla, uh, who really believed that science wins, you know, who understood that he had to transform a co controversial industry, not only a company who was known for drug making and remind people that at their core, they're really about science. And the scientists that you meet at Pfizer inspire you in ways that frankly blow you away. He actually came out in March of 2020 and against everyone's advice, said that we're going to have a vaccine this year. And there wasn't a scientist at any company, at any bio lab, even, even at BioNTech, which partnered with Pfizer, who thought it was possible to do it within the year. This is a guy who, who was a Greek Jew who came to this country, who was the son of the Holocaust. He lost members of his family, who really to his core believes that every life matters. And to him, every day that someone got COVID and died was, some, was one day that we could not let happen. So he knew, like kind of JFK with the moonshot, you know, he said, if I don't say it, it'll never happen. And people said, it'll take three years, five years, eight years, 12 years, and you, depending who you talk to. But nobody said one year. Nobody said within a year. He did. And then he also believed in collaboration, investing in bio labs, working with others, breaking down barriers in a very competitive industry. That kind of character, that kind of leadership allowed me then to go to other CEOs and say, I believe, too, that we're going to have a vaccine this year. And then I learned a lot about mRNA technology with the idea that if there's ever a variant, we're going to be able to adapt to it. There's going to be antiviral drugs that are going to let you live a life of normalcy. And that does feed into a CEO, you know, whether or not he or she leads with him with a certain amount of confidence or whether they have to kind of contract. Uh, but knowing the science around the pandemic allowed me to advise so many others and to watch him just be the CEO that he is, uh, was one of the, is still one of the great inspirations of my life. So I think that article in 2020 in Forbes was, was titled the, the rise of the global statesperson boss. So as those of us who don't run global organizations, but do have to some degree influence that goes beyond the borders of the United States, what, what's it, what do leaders need to think about during this coming decade, if you will, if 2020 was the advent of the global statesperson boss? You know, so I've been writing a lot about CEO statesmanship, as you mentioned earlier, um, and well before anyone was really thinking about it. I realized that the public sector, which is partly why my journey went private sector and civil society, the public sector wasn't able to do the kind of transformational leadership that you and I thought of when we were growing up and the heroes that we had from the Washington that you and I knew, there just weren't as many. There's some that are there. Trust me, there's some great U.S. senators and members of Congress that I admire greatly. And there's certainly people who serve in our administrations that are there for all the right reasons. But to have major impact, the private sector CEO in particular became more and more important. And, um, and the qualities in which they needed and the risk that they needed to take on uh, became even more important. Part of that's because of the employees, part of that's because of the customers, part of that's because of the investors. They expect that. It's a generational shift as well. But I, we saw, we were seeing more and more of that CEO statesmanship. The global part, another person I could mention who's, who's eternally young, 
someone I have the great fortune of working with is an 80 some odd year old man named uh, Klaus Schwab, who's the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. Uh, this is a guy who during 2020, 2021 went virtual. You know, Davos is known as being the great gathering. They just postponed it again because of um, uh, this new variant. But he managed to become relevant in days. He pulled people together. And what we learned in 2020 and 2021 is something that you and I both understood, but it became much clearer, is that whether we're dealing with George, George Floyd aftermath issues in this country around racism uh, and the lack of, um, of diversity, the, for the importance of creating an inclusive capitalism, we learned that it wasn't just an American phenomenon. It was a phenomenon that actually exists in most countries around the world. And what we were dealing with here were beacons and lessons and opportunities and models of struggle that they needed to deal with there, wherever there was. And he was able to, with his great convening power and catalytic power at the forum, was to have conversations, uncomfortable conversations, and create the best and brightest people to come together with really tight and urgent goals. We were able to be there with him and work with him. And we've got many clients that are working with him in ways that we really believe we can advance things. And the global part of that matters. The, the role of the CEO, he wrote about it when he was a young man in his earliest years as a professor. He wrote about what really is about stakeholder capitalism uh, and just capital uh, as his thesis, his PhD. And that became what birthed the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, he still is true today, more relevant today than ever. Another person who is another person in her 80s, you mentioned her too, Jane Goodall. You know, this is a woman who normally in good times travels 300 days of the year. She's, uh, she's everywhere. And her home world is, you know, how do we deal with the big challenges, economic, environmental, social, but how do we actually bring hope and solutions and real activism to finding those solutions urgently? And she's as devoted as ever. As ever. So when you look at young people, old people, Globally, we're all looking for answers and we're all looking for hope and we're all looking for an urgent solution to some of our biggest challenges. And my firm gets to be at the middle of a lot of that and to help bring people together. And that's where magic is, is found. When I think about the global statesperson boss, um, another person who comes to mind is Bob Iger, who is just stepping down right now as chairman of Disney after an incredible run as chairman and CEO. I know you had Bob on um, your radio show uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we both read his book, Ride of a Lifetime. What did you learn in your discussion with Bob that either amplified something you'd taken from the book or something that wasn't in the book that you thought was really interesting? That's a great question. I think he's one of the most extraordinary people of our time. And I, I would say one of the things that strikes me about him, insatiable curiosity always learning, always wanting to, whether it's about meeting the next person or discovering the next answer. Um, but it's also humility. He is confident, but he has such a great, wonderful, grateful side of him. Uh, and that, you know, seems to bring about what I, it's clearly humility. So many people write these books, uh, and you know many of them too, and, I, and several of them, and they're just, just heavy with cockiness or arrogance or a lack of humility. You read his books and you learn, but you're learning through his incredible success and some of the challenge, most challenging times he experienced and how he interpreted them and then kind of got back up and moved forward. Uh, and you took that book and you re read about his life and you really like him because he shows that vulnerability. He shares that, that um, humility in a very genuine way. He's I'm sad when certain people like him retire. Uh, he won't stop doing what he's doing, but he is truly a CEO statesman. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I wrote Bob a note and said to him that I, Ride of a Lifetime is a great appropriate title for his book, but I actually wrote him and said, I would suggest that the title should have been Legacy Keeper. Um, and the reason that I find Bob so interesting as being a legacy keeper is that he convinced Steve Jobs to sell him his legacy in Pixar. He convinced Steven Spielberg yep. Yep. to sell him Lucas, not Steven Spielberg, excuse me, George Lucas, to sell him Lucas Films and his legacy. And he even convinced Rupert Murdoch to sell him Fox. And I, as I was reading about all these multi-billionaire founders 
who they, of all the things that was important to them, it was the legacy of what they had built. There's something very unique in Bob from his character that made it so that those incredibly talented people felt that their legacy would be safe and carried on inside of Disney under Bob's leadership. And that, as I think about all the skill sets that would define Bob, that seems to me to be the success of the last 17 years as he ran the firm and to convince those people to do that. And there's some real gift there that he has as it relates to meeting with Steve. And he talks about it, as you well know, in the book at great length about how he convinced Steve to sell on Pixar and, and, and how he then approached Lucas. But it's just fascinating that these people thought that selling their companies to him was the right thing for them to do. You know, it's, it's really so true. You know, it goes back to the thing we talked about earlier about trust and, and people to people, the idea of relationships matter. You know, one of my board members is a great statesman, is one of my great mentors in my life, a guy named Morris Offit. Uh, he had Offit Bank and then Offit Capital, and he's just an extraordinary man, young in his 80s as well. He taught me in my 20s that when, you, when someone leaves your office, take them down the elevator, walk them to your lobby. He said, that's your home, that's your office home. First of all, it's a great sign of respect. Second of all, as people start to reflect on the meeting they just had, they often want to question what they disagree to. And at the end of the day, we're all about people, we're all in the relationship business. And if you don't forge that trust, where the person leaves knowing that they've given whatever they've given up to a person who's going to treat that trust with a certain sacred bond, um, you're not going to be, things will unravel, it, it, it won't advance. I kind of think of Bob Iger that way. Bob Iger believes every person, you go through anything in his book or you see the, the master class that he does, and everything's about the human being, that meeting, the negotiation, you know, the, that, that developing that kind of across the table trust that has allowed even the adversaries of the past become his friends of the future. And I think um, that just says a lot about who he is as a leader and why he's special, uh, that trust matters. You talked about Morris on your board. Um, I'm curious, you sit on a ton of boards. You also have a fantastic board at Laurel. Um, I'll pick two friends of yours and mine, and um, I don't need you to critique them, but I wanna get a sense of what you look for in board members. So I look at someone like David Bradley, who is an amazing entrepreneur, um, wildly successful in the business world, wildly philanthropic uh, with his time and his money. Um, and then I look at someone like Dane Butswinkus, one of the best lawyers you or I will ever know, um, a fantastic litigator at Williams and Conley. They both sit on your board. What, why those skill sets? And if you will, just to compare and contrast a little bit here, and we don't have to take David and Dane and give them a 360 live on, on, on the podcast, <laughs> but I'm just curious as you put together boards, because you sit on so many, what are you looking for? that says to you, someone like David or someone like Dane is an exceptional board member? That's a great question. Um, I would say for me, um, I'm in the advice giving business, if you know what I mean. And, and whether it's in professionally or personally, I expect, and I'm expected to, you know, to kind of tell you, um, what do you think, Alan? And, and what do you think we should do, Alan? And um, it is a wonderful gift to me that I have a board where they, they get the benefit of my advice to them because I won't hold back about their lives. Um, but I am so grateful to have them on my board um, who are always willing to give me advice. And, you know, you pick two of, of, of several great people on my board who are just wonderful at giving you advice, not what, as you and I talked about, by you, not always wanting to give you the advice you want to hear, but the advice you need to consider. And David and Dane both are people who are known for saying, don't do something. I was in a situation several years ago where I was able to, to I would have won a, a lawsuit a couple of times where I would have won the lawsuit. It would have been an easy lawsuit to have had. And I remember exactly where I was when Dane called me. And, you know, he's a great litigator. And he called me on the phone and he said to me, if this were any other person, I would say sue. And I would be there with you. And I will be there with you if you decide to do it in this case. But Alan, I know you, and I know that you do not want to be distracted. And my advice to you, and I know you're getting advice from everybody around you who says you should pursue that lawsuit. Um, and it was a personal thing. I was in a car accident. And he said, don't do it. Don't do it. You don't need it. And you don't want it. And it's not worth it. 
And while I enjoy it as your lawyer, I would not enjoy watching you do something you don't want to do. It was as if he, he found my voice and he heard my words that I hadn't articulated in my own head. It's the kind of lawyer he is. He's an incredible friend and a great advisor where he will look at what's in the best interest of you. And he's only the winner that he is. He only wins, as you know. When he does something, he only wins. It's, it's, it, there's, no, there's no gray for him. I, if I'm going to do it, we're going to do it. We're going to win, which I also admire. Uh, David Bradley is one of the most thoughtful renaissance men I've ever known. Uh, you know, he is, he could do anything, I feel like. Uh, he, he is the example of confidence with humility. You know, he, if you want him to be in your life, you're so lucky to have him in your life. But he'll never jump in unless you're in an urgent situation and he sees you falling off that cliff and no one's watching. Um, he doesn't want to invite himself in unless he wants to be there. But when he's there, he's all in. And I've had wonderful sessions with him uh, where he literally gave me his time one day after another, literally um, every evening for a week in order to help me think through things. And some of the most simple things um, that just seemed so simple when he said it were so complex before he stated it, I've gotten from David, you know, things like, you know what, don't listen to that, do that, that's your gut, helping you figure out your own voice, it's really, really wonderful, it's so wonderful to have them on my board, so you, I, do, I believe in being a good board member, I, I'm a, I'm a, I, I consider being a good board member, everything, well, yeah, you sit on so many. I don't see how you have the time for it all, but that's a whole different story. Um, I'm sure you're you're a fantastic board member and wildly insightful. And I'm also sure that you um, pull from the learning that you have on one board over the other. So on that, let me let me let me go for a moment to sitting on the board of Morehouse College. Um, what an incredible organization to sit on the board of, particularly right now. Um, Robert Smith shows up at graduation 2019 gives this incredible speech and in the speech says, I'm gonna write a check for $34 million and take care of everyone's student debt in the class of 2019. Stunning, I know you were involved in all of that and just an incredible act of uh, generosity and also underscored the issue of student debt. Um, I'm not personally a proponent of eliminating all student debt out there. I think those people who paid off their student debt like me um, should, you know, there's a reason we took time and money to make money to pay off our student debt. So just coming up like Elizabeth Warren says and letting go of the trillions of dollars outstanding, I'm not an advocate of, but I also thought that Robert Smith's gift to Morehouse and what that gift to those students was to come out without that burden was incredible. And, and then this past year, when Reed Hastings and his wife, Pat, Patty, gave an enormous gift to um, both Morehouse as well as Spellman, um, someone who hadn't gone to the university, but saw the issue as it relates to um, education, how important education is to um, racial justice and racial diversity in America, and making such an enormous $120 million gift um, to go to both Spellman and Morehouse and the United College uh, what is it, the United College Negro? The, the United College Fund, UNCF. Yeah, exactly. Um, so talk for a moment, Alan, because you've been very involved with all of that sitting on the board of Morehouse about how those gifts and how historically black colleges and universities are dealing with being in the spotlight right now, because not only are they the beneficiaries of all this, but there's also increased expectations that they are going to create the men and women um, uh, leaders of tomorrow? You know, it, it's a great question. I would say one of the great honors of my life is to be on that board of Morehouse College. And, uh, and I just, just, just mentioned a quick thing. One of my great moments in life was to be on the stage as a trustee in, in cap and gown when Robert Smith made that announcement about eliminating the, the debt of that class. And, and he, he's done more than that. He didn't just eliminate that debt. He actually has worked with all of the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities, to tackle the debt issues and find ways to finance in a way that will eliminate or minimize the burden of debt in a way that advances you by having kind of pay it forward. You know, those who actually um, who are involved before can actually help those who follow. And he's created a stu student freedom initiative that has been pretty powerful. But to be on that stage uh, and to hear that, it's, it struck me as a Morehouse man, uh, a trustee, but also as someone who who understands what it feels like to look in the eyes of young people and to see that liberation, that knowing that I can dream, 
and I can be anything. I will say from the first moment I went on the campus of Morehouse, I was struck by something very important. And that is they teach and have taught young men to be leaders, first and foremost, to forget whether you're there for sciences or you're there for the humanities or you're there for, uh, you know, your economic degree, it's to lead. And, and, they, and the, the way young students there approach you when you come on campus, and we should get you there, Willie, uh, it is so extraordinary, so ex exceptional. It's true that in the last year and a half, uh, since um, you know this reawakening around uh, systemic racism in our country, the philanthropic focus on HBCUs has become, um, you know, intensified. It's become a real priority. It's been wonderful to see. It's well deserved. When you talked about the UNCF, you know, um, Dr. Michael Lomax is this is the head of that. He's one of these great leaders of our time. Uh, at Morehouse, Dave Thomas uh, is he, he was at Georgetown for many years. You probably knew him then. And you had him on your you had him on your video show recently. What 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 did what did what did Dave say during that? You know him well. You said yeah. things with him. What did he say on your radio show that surprised you? You know he um, well he doesn't want people to give as a check and a box of racial diversity. He wants people to give because they understand the marvel and the and the um, and the exceptionalism of one individual and understand that when you invest in one, you invest in the world. He knows that, and he's impressed, he knows uh, that Morehouse and Spelman and so many other colleges uh, that he's been involved in, but certainly Morehouse um, is deserving of your investment. I think you've had Wayne Frederick, if I'm not mistaken, who's a great friend from Howard. Uh, you know, what he's doing at Howard is also pretty extraordinary. And I think what this did is this, this last 18 months has allowed people to understand that if you really want to create the kind of capitalism, the kind of, the kind of society that we all need to imagine and, and realize, uh, we really have to be investing in the next generation. And I think Dave Thomas will challenge you uh, to put your money where your mouth is, but also not to write a check only, but partner with me. In other words, you know, if you have some ingenuity, experience, opportunity, pipelines of talent, that you can bring forth uh, in addition to your resources financially. I want that too. And I think that's the thing that we don't always realize. You as a philanthropist know that it's not just the check writing that matters, it does. It's the partnership that matters if you stay in the enduring part on which you work. You know, a lot of what we do with our clients is we not only help them find the ways to give, we really work hard to make sure that that is realized and enduring for many years to come. Uh, and that it's not just a transactional moment, but a transformational moment. And I would say that the Wayne Fredericks of the world, the, the David Thomases of the world, the Michael Lomax of the world, who are at the front lines of trying to fight for this kind of diversity and inclusivity that we seek in this, uh, this country, they want the partnerships as much as the money. So another, um, another uh, it sounds like someone's trying to get into your, get into your room. It's all good. Um, the, uh, uh, if you think about, just Capital. Uh, you were one of the co-founders of Just Capital in 2013. Some incredible co-founders in Paul Tudor Jones, Deepak Chopra, um, Ariana Huffington, a bunch of other people. Um, just Capital just came out with a partnership with CNBC um, to basically rank companies on their ESG and DEI achievements. Um, there's obviously plenty of controversy around people like Larry Fink um, saying that BlackRock wants to focus on these metrics and invest in companies like this. You, 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 you listen to Squawk Box any given morning when this topic comes up and half the people are saying, awesome, this is great. It's just what CEOs and companies ought to be doing. And then there's a whole other side to it, um, typically led by Joe saying companies ought to make money for shareholders and that's it. And it begins and ends with that. And that's what they ought to really focus on. But one of the things that I found very interesting and I was um, excited about, Alan, is that the approach from Just Capital is really to use metrics to quantify these issues and to not just use subjective measures to say you're a really good corporate citizen or whatever else, but to create definable outcomes that companies and CEOs can drive for to be on that list and to be mentioned as one of the truly great companies that understands really the partnership between making money and being a good corporate citizen. Talk a little bit about how you came up with that at Just Capital. 
Sure. You know, one of the things I, I, I was struck by was when there were the moments before this, your, this webcast started, you were showing, I guess, quotes from other prior webcasts or conversations. And one, I don't remember exactly what it said, but it struck me in the way that Just Capital does. John Rice, who we're both friends with, uh, he's on your board as well, if I'm not mistaken. Right. He said something about how we want to pull them in, not put them out. I, I don't, there was a better quote that I'm giving. I'm not giving uh, justice to his quote, but that's very much at the core of Just Capital is how do we draw in through metrics and standards, a common place for us to work with, to bring in companies and bring in their leadership in order to see themselves as being part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And not just blast them by saying you're not doing well, but to work with these big companies in particular and bring them in to do better. And, and, and the CEOs who want to do better, that who really want to advance, who, who understand that it's either the way they lead and the way they participate in the community or the products that they produce are good for the, are, for the climate, are good for culture, um, are, are just good for, um, for society, you know, we want them to advance and we want them to figure out the best ways to transform and transition. And I think uh, Just Capital understood also something that we needed to understand well before it became as widely understood today. And that is that Main Street isn't just um, you know, the regular customer, but a very demanding customer who is not, who has choices. And they, and they also include their neighbors who are the analysts and the, and the investors and, you know, and the employees. And they're going to say and demand that the companies that they work with are the companies that are going to do right by us. So Wall Street needs to meet Main Street and we have to create the common language, the right language, the right metrics in which they can see um, where we are, where we're going. Uh, in a way that actually shows progress. So we rank them, but it's not ranking you with the idea that we want you to be on the other side and ridiculed or ostracized. It really is to find a way to bring you in and to find ways in which the just team can work with you in order to advance for better good and greater good, not in an idealistic only way, but in a pragmatic way. And you know Paul Tudor Jones, who really is the active chairman. He doesn't know how to do anything that's not pragmatic. He might be an idealist, but he, yeah, he's got to move quick. And we have to advance. And this was a this was the imagination and vision of Deepak Chopra, who realized that there was something there, that their capitalism needs to be just, that we have to embrace a better capitalism, and that there's a real interest, demand, and opportunity. And and then we all came forward together. So my final question to you, Alan, because we're running out of time here, and I could obviously keep on going with you for a long time. Um, you were involved with a Fortune magazine poll that was taken on CEOs back in June of this year in conjunction with Deloitte. And in that survey of CEOs, uh, one of the interesting one was that 52% of CEOs thought we would be beyond the pandemic by the end of 2021. Um, so those 52% are clearly, <laughs> clearly wrong. Um, yet, I think there still is 77% of them thought that the economy in 2022 would be very, very strong. Um, but the one that I wanted to ask you about was asked in an open-ended question to name the biggest challenge they faced. The CEOs mentioned talent more than anything else. So as you work with your CEOs, given what's going on in the world, what are you advising your clients to do as it relates to both maintaining and attracting new talent in this new world that we live in of open one day, shut the next day, at the office one day, at home the next day, and then also the, the, great, the great resignation that we see taking place where people are making life decisions that we've never seen them make before to just say, you know what, like my job, but I'd rather be doing X and they just up and go. What are, you, what are you focused on as it relates to the companies that you're working with to be able to maintain and attract new talent? Yeah, that's that magic word that we're finding out of this uh, last hour, which is the word trust. Yeah, the only way they can actually establish trust in their own internal culture is to, is to speak with certainty about the uncertainty uh, and to show humility because the, the CEOs that have come out and said, we're gonna be back in the office by now, or we're gonna do this then, have had a kind of retreat. Uh, the CEOs who say, we're going to figure this out together, there's a lot of uncertainty. But the one thing that I will tell you that I'm absolutely committed to is you and us and what we're building together. They're the ones that are doing the best internally, morale-wise. They're the ones that people are wanting to stick by and stick with. And I don't know, the great resignation baffles me. Uh, I would, th you know, in so many ways, because um, I think some of the young people in particular who are, who are quitting to move on probably are making a mistake long-term in some cases, and I worry about them. 
um, with the, that's a different conversation that we can have, you know, with the, the strategic impact of your life. But the ones who are saying, I don't want to resign, I want to stick to this, are the ones who really believe that the helm and understand the helm that they've got a leader, he or she, who are articulating with great confidence that we will navigate fine through doing these uncertain times and to embrace the fact that there are a lot of unknowns still. And there always were. It just happens to be right now, it's a lot more of a roller coaster ride than expected. Um, but look at how well so many companies have done in adapting. Um, there's a lot of challenges of being worked from home, uh, which you need to embrace and accept. And every person has a different circumstance. But uh, there's been a lot of really wonderful ways in which CEOs have now communicated with their, with their employees uh, that they never would have done pre-pandemic. They never would have had access. Even what you're doing with your webcast and what you're doing with the way you communicate across your company I'm sure there are things you were doing that allowed you to communicate in a much more personable and intimate and direct way through technology in some cases that allowed you to be better known than you were even before. And I think that's been wonderful. I think the challenge is people want to work together and they want to be back in the office more. And I think um, that will come. There's an antiviral pill that will be available soon. And the and between vaccines and by one of your clients. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, between the antiviral pill and the vaccine, I think there'll be a level of certainty that we'll be having some form of normalcy in the not too distant future very soon. But I think um, watching these leaders lead with confidence, but humility and a level of understanding that this, these are uncertain times is the trick. And that's the answer because it's authentic. It's uh, super insightful and helpful. Um, I have loved spending this hour with you. I will tell you that as much as I've enjoyed the last hour, you and I finding each other in New York City three weeks ago and finding two chairs in the middle of a hotel lobby that was packed to be able to sit there and talk to one another face to face. There is nothing like that face to face interaction. Um, but this is a very, very good second. Um, thank you, Alan. Um, happy holidays to you and your family. Greatly appreciate you taking the time and joining me. Uh, to everybody who is listening today, thank you for joining us. We will be back early in the new year uh, with an incredible lineup of people, including David Rubenstein, who uh, Alan and I, I guess, are going to share sometime early in the new year. My friend Jim Courier, the tennis player, um, Brad Gerstner, the hedge fund uh, uh, owner operator of Altimeter Capital and a bunch of other people. So very much looking forward to future discussions next year. Alan, thank you again. Happy yeah. holidays to you and your girls and uh, to Daphna. And we'll talk to you soon. Much love to Sheila and the boys. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.